Hey adapters, I'm Doug Parsons. I'm a partner at Simpatico Studios where we live stream conversations about complex business and social challenges with professionals like yourself who are working on the same issues. Our shows are live stream in front of a global audience of your professional peers on Simpatico.tv. I'm building a new type of online community for professionals like yourself on the Climate Adaptation Channel. If you're a regular listener of my America Adapts podcast, I think you'll find that we're taking our conversations about important problems, policies, and solutions to the next level here. And if you're interested in being a guest, we'd love to hear from you. And now join us for this latest episode. Hey Adapters, welcome back. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Dr. Shuli Goodman. Shuli is the founder and executive director of LF Energy. Shuli spent the early part of her career enabling some of the world's largest companies to become internet ready. Her doctorate in organizational systems focused on innovation and the energy transition. And now she has brought her digital first cross industry background to the electricity sector. LF Energy, a Linux foundation initiative supports open source innovation in the energy and electricity sectors. Julie will discuss her career journey to LF Energy and their vision. We'll also discuss how democratized open source commuting projects have transformed several industries, and she shares the important implications for climate change mitigation efforts. Hey, Julie, welcome to the show. Hi, it's really good to be here. All right, I'm very excited about this conversation. Open source, you know, it's something I, I need to learn more about. But before we get into that, I want to just check in. COVID-19, how's it impacting the work you're doing? I know you're kind of working remotely, but what's going on in that respect? Uh, you know, it's a little bit like a split screen. Um, my, you know, I wake up and I start my days very early. I'm in California and um, I'm actually about six miles from where the Wall Bridge fire was. Uh, you, you'll hear me clearing my voice a little bit right now because um, there's still, a fair amount of smoke in the air and particulate. Um, so climate change is really front and center. But with regards to COVID, what's been interesting is I spend my mornings really with Europe, uh, the middle of my day with North America, and the end of my day with uh, Asia and Australia. And so I have had this real split screen experience of, of kind of being with people as they journey through COVID and looking at national policies and personal policies and families, it's been fascinating. I mean, it, you know, it's a tragic time and it's also been kind of this interesting opportunity for all of us to be going through something together. Sure, sure, like a once in a lifetime, what if this happened? How would it unfold across the, the world? Yeah, it really has been fascinating in that respect. Well, let's talk about what you do. And I, I want to talk as first part of this conversation about your career journey. You know, you're from the enterprise software industry, but here you are at LF Energy. Can you kind of briefly take us through that process? How did you get to where you're at right now? Um, you know, I spent the early part of my career building uh, some of the first uh, content management systems and working with companies on their enterprise information management. Uh, during that, I really got involved in stakeholder engagement. Um, but there's some big lessons that I learned from being so early in working with the internet, and that's really about convergence and this notion of multiple uh, industries coming together. And, you know, we had an imagination in the mid 1990s that telecommunication and media and, um, you know, would all come together. And here we are. And it's even it's way beyond, I think, what we ever could have possibly imagined. And it happened in less than 30 years. It's a really quite extraordinary transformation that happened at a planetary level. All right. Well, so what are some of the companies that you actually work for? What are some of the, those tech companies? Um, I, you know, I did uh, a lot of the initial uh, internet um, strategies for uh, Nokia, uh, HP, um, Daimler Chrysler. Did a lot of work uh, with automotive companies. Nissan um, also worked, um, you know, with uh, uh, state departments of education and stuff like that, but really did a lot of work, uh, Lucent, uh, a lot of work with uh, technology companies that were really looking at how to become internet ready. 
Well, you know, as I was getting ready for this episode, I was you know, doing some homework. And I was looking at sort of how tech has transformed. And I had a conversation with my children about, you know, I've experienced, I think, a broad spectrum, you know, early DOS systems and all the things that how computers have really changed. And so you were, you've been in similar ways, you just this transformation of the tech industry, you know, it's really been quite fast and quite dramatic. It, it, it has, and, and, you know, kind of what got me sort of pivoting towards energy is um, I, I had one of those kind of emotional experiences where you're having, I had an imaginary conversation with my unborn grandchildren. And during that conversation, they asked me what I did during the great transition. This really led me to start thinking about this time in a different way, that we are really fundamentally pivoting. And I don't think I knew very much about energy policy. I know a lot more now about the role of energy and the, you know, what has happened in the last 150 years, both to our economies, to our cultures, uh, and to the grid. Uh, so when I was doing that, I really, I, I kind of had this aha, I need to change what I'm doing. So I went and I got a PhD in uh, really in innovation and in particular in the adoption and diffusion of innovation. Because what I wanted to understand was how, how are the choices that we make from a technology perspective? How do they inform the future as it emerges and that it becomes kind of like the DNA of the future. So knowing what it is that happened in the sort of first 25, 30 years of my life um, really is informing how I'm thinking about the remaining 25 to 30 years of my life in terms of um, what the impact of uh, really a, a wholesale uh, transformation of the grid and, um, and also transportation, what that's actually gonna look like. So this conversation that you had with your, your unborn grandchildren, when was that? And would, would it be a different conversation today? Where, where are you at in that respect? Well, you know, it was probably about 17, 15, 17 years ago. So it was actually a while ago. And I now have two grandchildren. Okay. So, <laughs> and my most recent grandson was born about uh, three weeks ago. So, you know, I think that they figure at least at an imaginal level in a very, you know, in a, like very front and center. Cause I'm, you know, I'm really thinking about what is the world that they're going to inhabit? And, you know, because, you know, we're on the climate adaption TV channel. So you understand that uh, if 90% of the earth right now is habitable, uh, but the projections are that we're going to lose 20% of our habitable earth, that means that we're going from 90% to 70% earth being habitable in the next 30 years how that is going to change our experience as humans is, un, you know, is, is I, I don't even know that we can imagine the degree of, uh, you know, trauma and climate refugees and uh, civil collapse. Um, it, it, it's really quite extraordinary. So, you know, I think the lever that I'm pulling on is uh, this transformation to software defined infrastructure. Um, which is really what we do at the Linux Foundation. All right, so you're the founder of LF Energy there, I guess one of the founders. And so how old is the organization? And, you know, I guess you've talked a little bit about the motivations, but just why did you need to create LF Energy to do the things that you want to do now? Well, you know, it was it was really very organic process. Uh, I was doing some work for the state of California around time of use. I because I was the technology person, they had me um, uh, interview the investor owned utilities. And so I was I was trying to understand the capacity for, um, you know, micro marketing and in the process of having that conversation really understood how um, how antiquated the technology platforms were that that uh, that the IOUs were using, and that the regulators and the companies had a deep sense of misunderstanding about technology innovation and what the role of digitalization is going to be in that journey. So I I also was pretty dismayed by 
the um, the governance process from a public utilities commission standpoint. Um, it's it's very important that we have those processes in you know in the public. We're talking about regulated entities um, and something that is a benefit to to society. However, how we make policy and you know this is a policy person is kind of like back in the 1950s. There has been zero innovation in how we use either technology or how we use convening to really transform how we make policy. And so often you'll have people participate in three to five year policy initiatives in order to make um, you know, a reasonable estimation of the direction we should go in collectively and you'll get to the ninth hour, the eleventh hour, or the eleven at eleven fifty nine, and people will come in, and all of a sudden you'll end up with a baby with, you know, four arms and six legs and three eyes in order to satisfy satisfy all the stakeholders, and that that thing itself then does not really help us go in the direction we want to go in. So rather than being an accelerator, it actually leads to a kind of confusion in the marketplace. So I saw that and I, I started thinking about what do I think is the best example of governance on the planet? And because there actually, if there are any uh, PhD students out there, you know that there is very little that's ever been written about the optimum um, organizational models for utilities commissions globally. It just doesn't exist. So I started thinking about it and I opened my lens up as a technology person, person and I started thinking about the Lennox Foundation. And what I came to, to really understand, most people have never heard of the Lennox Foundation. It, you know, it, it, it's, we're like the quiet people that you don't know about um, upon which the entire planet runs. It, it's a very small group of people, you know, 250 people um, with this incredible impact. But what's important from, as a diffusion scholar that I, that I talk about is that you have the Linux kernel, which was hacked as a solution to, uh, you know, Sun and Unix and Microsoft uh, by Linus Torvald. Um, and in the course of, you know, really 25, 30 years went from a dorm room to being the paradigm upon which entire, you know, digital computing is Founded. And so you have, you know, IBM and now even Microsoft that, that gave up and are giving up um, all huge parts of their computing stack um, in order to really stay focused on uh, open source because it is much faster as, as a process. So anyway, nobody was killed, no standing armies, nobody has guns. And, and it went it, from nothing to really foundational and I thought to myself, that's what we need for the energy transition. We need a neutral governance environment um, that will allow for collective investment. And that's what LF Energy is about. Okay, so I got a couple of like, questions I want to dig in. And, but first, just so to give some context to people, open source computing. I mean, it might seem obvious to some, but what really is that? So people have a grounding in what's going on here. You know, there are, uh, you know, you could get into much historical conversations with people who are, who have been in the trenches with open source since forever. Um, but I think one of the, the most, uh, you know, it's really, it's a conveyance. Um, it's, it's a way of looking at intellectual property um, that makes it possible for collective investment to occur. In other words, you can have uh, natural competitors in the world um, like let's say in cloud, uh, you know, Google, AWS, IBM, et, et cetera, all um, working together on the non-differentiating code uh, that enables interoperability at the cloud. And that's what the Cloud Native Computing Foundation did. It went from an idea to being, um, you know, in 15 years, really cloud went from an idea to being ubiquitous. Uh, so. That's how I think of op the notion of open source. There are 50 million uh, GitHub projects that are, uh, you know, open source, or or maybe it's 25 or 30. But you know, there are a lot 
millions and millions. Um, at the Lennox Foundation, we have about 320. And what we're doing is we're, we are convening for our stakeholders, those companies that are seeking to build uh, the non-differentiating code that is essential, whether it's for 5G or it's for automotive, like automotive grade Linux or uh, LF networking um, or blockchain hyperledger or let's encrypt, which encrypts you know, the internet or Node.js, all of those are our Linux Foundation projects. Okay, so we're gonna get a little bit technical here too, but I want you to walk us through, and, and I just so you know, right now I have a scene collection up that's you and me, but then there's the diffusion curve and people yeah. can see that. What's this all about? So I think that um, one of the ways that I talk to people about you know, this notion of what does it mean to say we're going fast or as it, from a diffusion perspective, how do we think about how we get from where we are now to where we need to be in 30 years from now. And I often ask people to put themselves into the future and imagine themselves 30 years from now. How old will you be? How old will, will your children be? Just so that you get some perspective and then look back to where we are today. So a typical adoption curve um, is kind of like a bell curve. It's soft, it's gentle, and uh, you know the the you know from the innovator to early adopter to um, early majority to laggards that that whole process it is regardless of whether you're talking about you know boiling water in the Andes or adopting an iPhone or uh, you know the transition to renewable energy that bell curve and those. Um, phases are going to maintain uh, relative constancy regardless of what uh, discipline you're looking at. The diffusion curve that we have for decarbonization is kind of straight up and down. We're talking about right now, it's at 9% a year in terms of decarbonization. Every year that we wait, it just gets steeper. So if we spend the next two or three years fiddling around, it'll be 13% or 14%. And, and those sorts of diffusion curves um, require, uh, you know, um, there are some examples of things. I mean, I, I think that, um, that, 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 that the internet, um, that uh, cell phones, um, uh, TVs, you know, there are some examples of, of diffusion curves that have been, you know, very intense, but, you know, the transition to renewable energy, the, the transition or the great transition and all the different parts that it means with regards to climate adaption um, is not just a technology phenomena, it is also a human phenomena. And so humans have to be able to uh, transform and, um, you know, they have to adopt these things. And, and so that human process then becomes increasingly important. The governance becomes increasingly important because you're trying to figure out how do you move fast um, with many different people with various different agendas. And part of what open source has shown us is that you can have uh, you know, tens of thousands of developers working on something and that you don't have to make everybody do the same thing people can scratch their own itch. And that as long as people keep contributing it back upstream, then what happens is that thing that you have, um, rather than having a siloed solution, you begin to have you know, increasing impact um, because that thing becomes um, more and more uh, substantial. Does that, does that make sense? Sure, sure, and, and I guess just me. <laughs> And so your role with LF Energy is your tr this curve. I, I get this notion, and you know you you're trying to accelerate this. And so what what's part of that process and such? Well, I'm a gardener. Um, you know, I, I I often talk about um, that. You know, I'm a poet first, a gardener second, <laughs> and a technologist third. And um, and but the part about being a um, you know, the part about being a poet is I really value kindness. And so ultimately, I think that having an, an integritous community and an integritous ecosystem that is not kind of based on, uh, you know, the shark tank approach is important. So I think that that comes across in my leadership. 
Um, but the gardener part is that I, I really truly believe what we have to do is because we don't know what the future is going to be and that there are going to be many innovations that are occur, going to occur, that what becomes important is that we really focus on the conditions. So I look at power systems and today globally and I think about, well, what are the conditions that need to be addressed? And there are both policy conditions, organizational conditions, and technology conditions. Um, I focus less on the policy, and I just trust that somehow, you know, we're, we're going to meet in a meadow somewhere. <laughs> but um, I do spend an enormous amount of time looking at how to build capacity. Uh, and how to build capacity in engineers. Um, in the past, uh, the way that information and communication technology has been used has been more of these monolithic platforms. But if you look at cloud native technologies, if you look at the transformation that's occurred because of distributed ledger technologies, what you begin to see is something that's more about microservices. And so, when you see our functional architecture, and I don't know if you have that slide, um, but when you, when you get into that functional architecture and you can see it on our website, what, you're, what you actually are looking at is a taxonomy uh, for the organizational structure functions of the grid of the future. And that those things represent microservices. And so what we want to create is a, a composable a grid. And so in order to get to a composable grid, you have to begin to have the developers and the architects that can even imagine a composable grid as opposed to a monolithic grid. And you know what we had in the past were silos. So you had a high voltage, medium voltage, low voltage, behind the meter, energy efficiency, you know, and it was like these, everybody was like this. And people have spent a lot of time thinking about the transmission distribution interface. Um, but what I'm seeing is that the really progressive kind of unicorns in that, in the utility space are really recognizing that those distinctions are going to really disappear. Um, that there will be technical requirements, um, but that the functional requirements are relatively the same regardless of where you sit. Uh, and they all need to communicate with each other. All right. So some of the research that you're doing at Elf Energy, there's this notion of the internet of things. What, what do you mean by that? So what, you know, so I, I think that um, the word that I like to use these days actually is software defined infrastructure. So the internet of things really is about this notion that uh, distributed energy, so energy devices that both produce energy or consume energy or are both loads or resources that sit at the edge, um, customer owned assets, for instance, um, are going to become an increasingly important part of the grid of the future. That, that notion of centralized, you know, fire it up, send it over 200 miles or 200 kilometers and, you know, flip the switch and you've lost 60% of your electrons from generation to flipping the switch. That, that that is an inherently unsustainable model. And while those assets have provided great um, kind of collective social um, support, um, th they're not necessarily the right way to be thinking about organizing the grid of the future. So, you know, I, again, I think a lot about composability and being able to um, create uh, the, the communication infrastructure um, that enables um, communication from the edge to be orchestrated and choreographed. And so, and, and that that is something that is much more distinctly associated with telecommunications or um, the internet. And so, so those are two, um, two concepts that are connected, but they're, they're different. In other words, the IOT part or the internet of energy is the edge. Um, and then the orchestration and choreography is um, 
how uh, power systems in the future, network operators, are going to in fact orchestrate uh, and choreograph uh, supply and demand. So who are, who are some of the organizations that you're working with on this? Because you know, you're there providing this governance, but like, what, what are some of the organizations and I guess the project work going on? Um, well, you know, we started with um, several contributions from RTE, who's the French transmission system operator, and they were really our founding member. And they had a very forward view of where they wanted to go and a recognition that the solution for France was not um, to solve decarbonization just for themselves, but that they had to participate globally. They also recognized that they could not do it alone, that they needed, um, they needed their fellow utilities. Um, so uh, Aliander, who's a distribution system operator in the Netherlands, um, really stepped in last year um, with RTE and said, you know what, we are going to uh, join together and build strategic dependencies be between our R&D efforts so that we can get a force multiplier. And I can tell you that I am blown away by what they're doing. Uh, I mean, they went from a very short period of time of just not even really knowing each other um, to building all sorts of strategic dependencies, um, whether it's the digital substation effort or virtualization, or it's the communication protocols. Uh, GXF was the, one of the projects that Aliander put in um, that really in, uh, you know, sits between the central hub um, and the edge. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Operator Fabric is the UX that really allows you to wrap in all kinds of applications, containers. Um, you know, it has a very open API um, so that you could you could actually be looking at water and electricity in the same environment if you needed to, which in California is something that's very important um, and, be able, and be able to actually manage the messaging rather than using uh, faxes or phone calls, which is really how coordination is still done in the United States. Um, spreadsheets, faxes, um, phone calls, and, and humans. And so um, those are just some of the projects. I, I can keep going, but. Well, listen, we want to have you on multiple times and maybe that's what a future episode. We're just getting toward the end of this episode. And I, and I guess a lot of complex topics that we've talked about today, or mainly you explaining to me what these things are, but um, and what's next though? I mean, there's this whole notion of decarbonization is, is this sort of goal, but like what's next for you? Like six months, a year from now, as you're working with these different partners and you're coming up with new projects, where do you go from here now? How do we get closer to that decarbonization with what well, we have a huge pipeline of members and of software. We have really we're starting an e-mobility project, open ADR, a full implementation from Europe is coming in. Um, that, uh, you know, almost every utility in the United States uses open ADR and every single one of them is different. Um, if we actually start to standardize on some of this demand response software, we actually can build things out. So where do I think we're going? Um, for me, it is all about software and members and it, it, you know, the software is what attracts the members and the members hopefully attract each other. Um, because people begin to see that it's a great opportunity, um, you know, for their R&D. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's really what I think about all day long and, and how to build capacity in people, how to help them to really understand um, what does it mean to create a composable grid. Uh, and, you know, for me, it's also looping in um, the, the networking people, the cloud people, the other folks, the, my sister projects at the Linux Foundation for them to really understand what we're doing. So it, it, we have a hundred plates spinning. It, 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 it's crazy. Um, but when you recognize that 75% of the decarbonization effort is actually going to happen through the transformation of the grid and the transition of electric mobility, from mobility to electric mobility, um, then you really recognize that there's kind of this outsized um, critical uh, effort that we need to produce, which is we have to make our grids green. So that's what I'm gonna do all day, every day from now till then. <laughs>
Well, excellent. And part of, you know, just before we wrap this up, but I just think we're, we're having this interview right now. It's about communicating what you're doing here. And I've had conversations with people working on the grid and we're talking clean energy. And, you know, I think part of what you're doing too is just awareness building. And is that a, a bigger part of your, your day job now? It's just sort of saying this open source approach to what we're trying to do here, more people need to, to understand this. And it, yeah, yeah it, is that, I guess, taking up more of that, your day job? Yeah, I mean, I think my job is to communicate and to uh, signal um, the tremendous value from a leverage development model. And, you know, what I really want to do is to build coordination between the United States and Europe. Uh, I imagine there are quite a few people from Europe listening. And um, I think that Europe has clear decarbonization goals, which is driving clear policy goals, which is driving markets, which is telling the operators what they need to be doing. And um, I think that whatever happens here in the United States, uh, you know, that's the direction we need to go in. And if that's not the direction that we need to, um, that it happens in the election, um, I think that it's really bad for the entire world, but. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're all waiting around for January and just a, hopefully a massive policy shift all up and down the, the what, what's going on with climate change. So yes, I know. Yeah, and safety, feeling a little bit more safe than what's going on right now, which is crazy. It is. Well, I wanna take you into our just chatting. We're gonna close out this episode. This has been fantastic. And as I think we've all talked with you about, we've just scratched the surface on some of the things you're doing, You know, future episodes drilling down into projects and stuff. We want you to look at Simpatico as a platform to have these conversations. And Love to. We just extend the, 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 the life of these conversations, but hold on, I'm gonna just close this out and we'll be right back.